Welcome to Common Sense Care, Parenting Gender-Confused Children with Truth and Love, the gender industry's one-size-fits-all answer for everyone who struggles with their sense of gender is affirmative care. But in no other area of medicine, education, or psychology is one treatment plan the best thing for every person. We believe that each child is an individual and should be given the care and treatment that's most appropriate for him or her. So welcome back. I'm Maria Kepler. And I'm Erin Brewer. And what are we talking about today, Maria? Today, we're going to talk about boys and gender dysphoria. Um, this is a topic that I think doesn't get enough treatment and sometimes doesn't get the right treatment. And I think one of the issues here is that typically um, males who wanted to transition were either um, autogonophilic men, and those are men who are sexually aroused at the idea of them being of themselves being a woman. And the more they can kind of infiltrate women's spaces, the more sexually aroused they get. Or gay, very effeminate boys who just feel like they'd fit in better if they transitioned and, and presented more feminine. Mm -hmm. I really believe we have a new phenomenon happening now. Um, these are rapid onset gender dysphoric boys who I believe are actually assuming a trans identity as a result of pressure. Because right now the common narrative is if you're a white male, you are the oppressor, you are the bad guy and there's nothing you can do about it. You are you know, basically marked for life as the bad guy. And the only way they can really opt out of that identity is to assume a different identity. And really a trans identity makes the most sense because we know that for whatever reason, um, the people who are pushing this ideology don't let you opt into a different race. So these white boys, if they came out and said, well, they're actually black, um, that wouldn't go over well for whatever reason. Um, but if they say they're women, suddenly they're celebrated and they're all of a sudden even more marginalized than you know <laughs> any other group. And so I really feel like it's sort of these boys, they're, they're sensitive, they're picking up on this hatred that people have for white men. And you know, it's a very smart response, hey, I'm just going to go ahead and, and opt into womanhood, and that way I won't be the evil oppressor. I'll actually be one of the marginalized. And traditionally, I think we always saw, almost always, that when men came out as transsexual, it used to be called transsexual, it was always adult men. It was usually men in their early to mid-20s coming out. There were those two groups that you mentioned, the autogynophiles and the um, ones who were homosexual, but were homophobic. They didn't want to admit being homosexual. So they adopted this, oh, I'm actually a woman inside persona. But yeah, we're seeing this cadre of younger men doing this, young boys, teenage boys. That cohort um, of the young children doing it, it's still predominantly girls. There's a huge, huge group of girls, but there's a growing segment of these young boys. And what you said about adopting a, a trans identity because it gets you out of being the oppressor, I think that goes also with girls because I've talked to young girls who've said, oh yeah, we would sit around in middle school and talk about how we were anything but white, cis, and het. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't want to be white. We don't want to be cis sexual cisgender, which means you identify with your birth sex, and we don't want to be heterosexual because those things are vanilla, those things are basic, those things are boring, and those things make you an oppressor. And so I think both in girls and boys, we're seeing that, well, I can't say I'm a different race because I'm clearly the race I am. Um, I can't say I'm a different age because that hasn't been accepted yet but I can claim a trans identity and all that requires is for me to say it. There's yep. no litmus test. There's no, um, there's no rules other than I just say that's what I am. Um, so I think there is, and you're right, there's a big group of boys that are doing that. And I think also we talked, was it last time or a couple of episodes ago about pornography mm -hmm. and that a lot of boys are being pathologized by the porn that's so ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. And I suspect we're seeing boys who are um, getting sucked into that hypnosis porn, the ASLR porn, 
and they're identifying with the women in that. And also I've heard of some boys like, um, I can never say his name right, Hashi, um, Hashi, who saw a really abusive male role model growing up. His father was quite abusive and said, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that person. I'm going to, I'm going to be someone different. And then we also have um, autistic boys who are you know, very black and white thinking. And if they have more feminine traits, they're going to be, you know, thinking, well, everybody says if I act and, and, and behave and think like this, then, then I must be a woman. So they, um, they just sort of follow along with that. So there's a lot of different classifications. I think one thing that's really important to parse out is whether or not the, the, the boy or young man wants to have uh, genital surgery. And that seems to be sort of the difference between the autogynophile who might want to get top surgery because I've actually heard um, autogynophilic men say they want breasts. And that way, when they get, when they want to play with someone's breasts, they're right there. They don't have to go find a woman for it, which is just a very sad statement that, um, you know, we've gotten to the point where it's easier for a man just to get his own breasts than to have to go form a relationship with a woman in order to have them to um, stimulate himself. Um, but, but so the surgery, it's that kind of surgery um, sort of indicates someone might be more of an autogonophile. Whereas if they get, um, if they get their penis and testicles removed, I think that that indicates more that they are um, the, the child who has been somehow brought into this cult in another way. And that's because the autogonophile wants to keep his penis because that's how he gets aroused. That's, you know, that's his source of arousal and he doesn't want to lose it. So, so I think that that's a good way to parse it out when you, when you um, think about this. And there's a lot of anger towards autogonophiles right now. And I think it's very justified because I think that they're actually pushing this on boys and girls and children and society in order to normalize their fetish and in order to normalize um, them going into women's protected spaces. Um, I can't tell you how frustrated I get when I hear, um, you know, an obviously autogonophilic male um, say that we have to fight for trans rights because he doesn't feel safe. And when he says he doesn't feel safe, what he means is his pronouns aren't, you know, his preferred pronouns aren't being respected. And he's being told he can't um, colonize women's spaces. Um, and, it, and it just shows a complete disconnect about what it really means to be unsafe, which is how women feel when we have men come into women's bathrooms in order to get aroused. Um, <laughs> a lot of gynophiles also don't feel safe in the men's restroom because men don't appreciate other men who dress like women generally. However, I have talked to a lot of uh, transsexual men who, who respect women's spaces and go into the men's bathroom. And none of them have reported ever having violence against them. Really? Wow. So, so I think that this is a, you know, that, that this is something that, I mean, I, they, they do say, you know, occasionally they'll get looks, but nobody's ever hurt them. And so oh. I think it's very interesting that they're using that and that people are like, oh, we don't want them to be hurt when they're, when they go into the men's bathroom. So we'll let them go into the women's bathrooms. Well, mm. how does that make any sense? Um, yeah. I feel like this is a little off topic because I did want to focus on these boys who aren't autogynophilic, who are in this identity um, because they have really distressed feelings about who they are. The self-hatred that they have for themselves as white boys um, and sometimes just as boys. I've even heard of, you know, um, boys of, of, you know, many different backgrounds who have expressed this. Um, saying, you know, that, 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 that there's so much hatred right now for men among cer certain circles um, that these boys are, are just desperate not to grow up and be men. Mm -hmm. I wonder too, and I'm just thinking out loud here, I'm thinking about how often parents divorce and quite often it's not an amicable, amicable divorce. And if these boys are hearing their mothers speak ill of their ex-husband, speak ill of men. I remember um, I had a significant breakup when I was in college and I was just furious with him and furious with men. And I, I guess I was 
telling man bashing jokes and just kind of being a real jerk. And my mom pulled me aside and she said, Maria, your father is a man Mm -hmm. and you are being really hurtful to him right now. And like, it just opened my eyes like, oh my gosh, my father's a good man. I don't, I don't want to hurt him. But when you're hurt, it can just be this, you know, you just explode it out against everyone. And, And I would imagine young boys pick up on that. Yes, especially if the mother has sole custody, if somehow the father's out of the picture, um, a lot of times the, the courts will award the woman full custody. Um, and, and, and like you said, I know I grew up, oh my gosh, um, the things that my mom said about my biological father. I mean, he was, you know, according to her, the devil incarnate. Um, mm-hmm. I can't imagine how hard that was for my brother to hear, um, especially, you know, one of the things that happened in my family, and I don't know if this happens in other families, but I could tell how angry my mother was with one of us by how, by if she started saying we looked like our fathers, um, she would oh. say, you know, especially my brother, if he started, you know, if she was very disappointed or angry with him, he, she, she would start saying, you're just like your father, or you look just like your father, or mm-hmm. how come you're so much like your father? Um, so it's clearly not not okay to be like your father. And Marcus and Susan Evans actually have talked about this, that when kids, um, you know, really have negative feelings about the parent um, of their biological sex, that sometimes they want to disassociate from that. And and like, she did that. I don't want to be like that. I'm going to be like my mom who takes care of me and she'll love me if I grow up and be a, a woman. But if I grow up and be a man, she may not love me. Wow, that's interesting. So what do parents need to do when their son, you know, comes out and says, I'm not a boy, I'm a girl, or I'm not binary. And I think it this seems, and I could be wrong, just my impression is this is happening more with older boys. Like I'm seeing more parents saying, my 18, my 19, my 20 year old did this. There are definitely those who are doing it younger. But I think there's two different ways of dealing with it, depending if your child is still at home, if he's not still at home. I liked what you said about parsing out, where do you think it's coming from? You need to know the root cause before you start dealing with it. But what would you counsel parents? Well, I think one of the things I want to address before we move on is that there is a whole group of little, little, very young boys who Mm -hmm. are assuming trans identity right now. And I believe that those are children who are being pushed into this by their parents. You know, I've talked to the, you know, I've seen screenshots of conversations with the parents. I've talked to some of them. I've seen videos they've made. These are children really young, like two, one, two, wow. three, four, five, six, really young kids. Mm-hmm. And I believe their parents are pushing them to be transgender for a number of reasons. Um, sometimes the boy's effeminate and the parents are really uncomfortable with that. Sometimes I think the parents just want to be the cool kids on the block. And if they have a trans kid, then um, they have all this social cred. So there are lots of reasons. So those are, that's a very different population because those parents are ecstatic about their child's trans identity. They don't want to do anything to help them resolve it, even though it means medicalizing their child and causing significant damage to those children's bodies. That's what I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I just, I don't understand people who think it's better to be trans, that it's better to medicalize. A friend of mine, um, the child uh, identified as transgender, the parents worked with the child. And after a couple of years, the child said, you know what, I'm not, I'm not and accepted the birth sex. Friends of those parents are telling them that they had undue influence on the child and that they're forcing the child to, to, why would you not say, oh, this is great. The child's going to accept their healthy body. They don't need hormones. They don't need surgery. The child's happy with who they are. Why would that ever be? Well, it's just so indicative that this is a cult and this Mm -hmm. is really not about what's healthy for the child. Um, And I think I would like to um, do a short clip here of Scarlett, who's a young man who um, was basically thought he was um, a a girl when he was about 13 or 14, started on puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, um, and talks about 
how his his both his body and his mind were kind of frozen as that of a child mm -hmm. and that um he, he he's not coming you know he's been off of these medications for a while now and things are not reversing um mm -hmm. but what he realized is that he had same-sex attraction and he was extremely uncomfortable with that um, for a number of reasons and that's why he um, chose to go this route and he said when he you know he therapists and doctors just completely encouraged this and pushed it and now his body is permanently damaged by these interventions this is not a healthy path it's a pathway of medicalization and damaging a healthy body so do you mind if we watch that real quick yeah, i'd like to see that i was 14 years old when i got my puberty blocker implant they told me that the puberty blocker was completely safe mm -hmm. after i was on it for a while um it it like castrates you stop developing in every way including mentally and emotionally which i didn't know and it, it, it was like being frozen in like a child's body i felt frustrated because it was like being trapped in a child's body you know with things not maturing correctly and possibly even atrophying so then even if i would go back i would have to live my life as a eunuch and i'm it's it's the exact awkward existence that I was trying to avoid, uh, but it was presented as the only option. Well, I just think that that's heartbreaking. Um, here is a young man who's damaged for life, and it's all because he was uncomfortable with his sexuality. Um, and I think that you know there are all different reasons that kids adopt these um, this identity. But I think that we have to be, um, I think it's important that we be compassionate towards them. I noticed that um, among certain circles, there's a lot of compassion for girls who get sucked into this ideology, not so much for the boys. Um, and again, I think a lot of this is coming from, um, you know, there is this, this acceptance of man bashing, of mm -hmm. blaming, you know, the patriarchy for everything. And, and so there isn't as much compassion for young men who are going through this. But as Scarlett illustrated, these are kids who are really struggling with intense um, feelings of self-hatred, with um, intense depression, with intense anxiety, and they deserve our compassion. Yeah, and, and it is heartbreaking to see kids being pushed into this. And they're told, they're told, whatever is making you uncomfortable, if you transition sexes, it's going to all be better. You know, autistic kids are told that. Kids with depression are told that. Kids with discomfort with their sexuality or lack of sexuality. Whatever a child comes to, unfortunately, most of the adults in his or her life now and says, I have this problem, they're going to hear, oh, you need to transition sexes. That's what's wrong with you. And it's just such a lie. And it's so damaging. We hear this from so many detransitioners. And it really is heartbreaking. Yeah. And you actually asked me earlier, and I never addressed it, how parents can um, deal with kids, both, you know, younger kids um, who, who have adopted this identity, younger teens, as well as kids who are out of the home. And I think, again, we go back to asking questions. We need, you know, parents need to ask questions. So especially when a child first starts to develop this, I think it's really important to emphasize to boys that it's okay to be feminine, that that's okay. And I know that historically, um, effeminate boys have been teased mercilessly. I remember as a kid, um, I was teased a lot, but I wasn't teased as much as the effeminate boys. And I was always, this is, sounds horrible, but I was always kind of thankful for them because they would take some of the pressure off me. Um, it was like, you know, instead of having all of the teasing at me, um, you know, if I were bit, being bullied and the effeminate boy walked by, they'd go after him, which is horrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was really, really sad. Um, and I feel, I feel really sad about that now, but that's just, you know, I, I feel like, um, you know, girls who are tomboys get teased, but they don't get called the kinds of names and they don't get mocked and they don't get you know, ostracized the way mm -hmm. effeminate boys historically have. So we really need to create a culture in which we accept effeminate boys. Well, and that seemed to be what feminism was working on for a long time, was eradicating these stereotypes that boys can't have feminine traits and girls can't have masculine traits and and we need to accept people for who they are and 
all of a sudden, that's no longer the case. Now, suddenly, instead of accepting those differences and those variations, we're going to say, no, if you have a difference or a variation, you have to trans this transition to the opposite sex. Yeah. And I mean, this is like throwing us back to the dark ages. Yeah, especially for these boys who are, you know, having their testicles removed, having their penises cut off, um, taking puberty blockers, which, um, you know, stunts their development. They retard their growth. They, they, mm -hmm. There's been studies now, I believe it's John Whitehall has shown that the IQ actually drops and stays lower if, you, mm -hmm. if these children take puberty blockers. If they take the puberty blockers followed by the cross-sex hormones, then those, those, you know, infertility, um, you know, the genitalia is frozen at the, you know, prepubescent stages, just um, micro penises. These are kids who are, and one of the things that, um, that I want to mention that just disturbs me down to my toes in a way that is just nauseating is that I do believe that there are, um, there's a certain group of pedophiles who are really happy about this because they're basically freezing these boys' bodies as young, you know, as, as child bodies as they grow up. And so pedophiles who are attracted to young boys are actually, um, I think, grooming some of these kids to embrace these medical transitions so that they can have access to prepubescent boys' bodies um, legally. And I find that really disturbing, but that was something that Scarlett mentioned that he felt that there were, um, you know, some, some predatory males who were pushing him to do this and were ecstatic about um, the way his body was uh, frozen as prepubescent because that's what aroused them. That's horrifying, Maria. Yes, that is horrifying. And, but it makes sense. Mm -hmm. It really makes sense because then you get the child's body with the age of consent, the legal age of consent. And, and yeah, the, the, you get the best of both worlds if that's your, if that's your perversion. Yep. Yeah. It's so disturbing. And we do have a clip from Sasha Ayad that I think is really um, helpful. She has, is one of the very few therapists who's really addressing what's happening with boys. And I think she has some important insights on it. And I think this is from her podcast with Stella O'Malley gender a wider lens so we don't actually have a video i think but we have audio so let's listen to that now maria okay. within the population of gender dysphoric males there are all these kind of subcategories and there is up a percentage of these males who may genuinely get arousal from the kind of discomfort people have yeah. around the fact that they are you know, presenting as female or in changing rooms. And I just want to point out, because one of the misconceptions that I think happens a lot for the ROGD boys is that there's always this kind of perhaps sexual gratification that comes from their trans identification. And that's not always the case at all, right? So you're talking about your experiences where this man was clearly gratified by making you uncomfortable, kind of forcing you to look at his body and his erection. And yet what I see, at least um, with the young males that I'm aware of and that I've worked with or consulted with is these are kids that are really hiding away and they're quite terrified of people's attention and they're completely, um, not always, right? But many of them are quite, quite innocent sexually. And they, just like the girls, are vulnerable to getting wrapped up in this entire movement, which gives a new name to all kinds of experiences they're having throughout their adolescence. So it's complicated to talk about gender dysphoria in males because there is such a variety of ways that this will present. And depending on the person and their individual pathology, this could mean very different things for different males who are struggling, quote, with their gender. Well, that podcast is really powerful. Uh, it's Gender a Wider Lens with Sasha Ayad and Stella O'Malley, and they cover so many topics. It's, it's similar to what we do, but I think they're approaching it less from a, you know, just the parents' standpoint. They're approaching it from, let's just kind of look at this whole phenomenon. So I really recommend that podcast. And I think that they primarily work with the children. And so, um, you know, that's sort of where their emphasis is. But I do feel like 
um, anybody who is um, in this, who has a child who's involved with this, it's worth uh, listening to. They're both um, excellent uh, clinicians and have great insights and are, are two of the few who are standing up and saying, no, we, you know, what's happening is wrong, that it's not okay to medicalize children's bodies, that it's easier to change the feelings than it is to damage the body. So I really appreciate their bravery in being willing to, to stand up. And, you know, so many clinicians I hear will say, you know, oh, we're really uncomfortable with this, but I won't say anything because I'll get fired. Um, so I appreciate them. Are legitimately, are legitimately afraid of losing their jobs. They're legitimately afraid of being targeted and doxxed yeah. um, when that happens. But we do, we need more people willing to stand up and say, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna capitulate to this anymore. I'm going to protect children because when we don't speak up, when we don't stand up, mm -hmm. we are protecting ourselves at the expense of the children. Exactly. And, and it's our duty to stand up and protect the children. I, you know, occasionally a troll will come on my Facebook page and say something like, why don't you mind your own business? You know, this is, and, and it, it is our business when it comes to children. It's the adult's responsibility to protect them. If their parents aren't doing it, it's our responsibility to step in. Um, society has an obligation to protect children. And that's why you and I are doing this. Partnership Ethical Care is doing this. Um, a whole group of other people are, are fighting this because it is our responsibility to protect the children. Yeah, exactly. Well, we have a couple of questions from parents. Um, the first one we may have addressed already. My ex-husband was a terrible example of how a man should be, and he made our son do boy things growing up, even though my son didn't like many of those things. Is that possibly where this trans ID comes from? You know, I think that it's a very uh, difficult thing to, to pinpoint exactly where mm -hmm. this trans identity comes from, but I do feel like um, if you have an effeminate boy who's not accepted by his father, and who is um, you know, potentially mocked or encouraged to, to behave in ways that are manly, um, that, that that could very easily um, cause a child to, to just say, hey, I'm not that, I'm, I'm just gonna go be a girl. And maybe my dad will accept me as a woman because he's certainly not accepting me as a son. All kids need to be loved and accepted, especially by their parents. Your parents are the first most powerful adults in your life. That's who you want to model after. That's who you want to, you know, you want them to love you. Mm -hmm. um, this might be a little bit tangential, but I posted a picture of a page from D60 Trans Detox on my social media. And it was just a page about love, that the first thing we need to do is tell our kids that we love them no matter what. We love them even when they hurt us. We love them even when they don't do what we want them to do. And somebody posted and said, this is stupid. I'm not gonna love somebody who hurts me and is nasty to me. This is stupid advice. Wow. This was a parent saying, no, if my mom doesn't do what I want, I don't have to, I don't have to be kind to them. Oh, I don't that's so sad. Them. That's it was really so hard. Sad. Yeah, because kids need that. I also want to put in a caveat that if, if, a, if, if there is a child who is effeminate and, and a father, um, you know, encourages them to do manly things occasionally, that I don't think that that's harmful. I think that, you know, as long as it's not done in a shaming way, but to say, hey, why don't you come hunting with me? Or let's go fishing, or you want to go shoot a bow and arrow, or can you mow the lawn? Like, you know, there are all these stereotypically male things. I don't think it's bad for, you know, I don't think it's going to cause any harm if a father invites a, an effeminate child to be involved in those things. It's, it's important to spend time with parents. And so I, I think that a lot of it has to do with the tone, the difference between, hey, son, I want to spend some time with you. Let's go camping versus you're a sissy boy. I'm going to man you up. We're going camping. You're going to toughen up. Those are really different. Um, and so I don't think that there's anything wrong with encouraging children to engage in, in you know, a variety of activities, but a lot, it really does have to do with that. And I have, I actually have heard, heard women who have talked about wanting to abort the baby if it's a boy who have so much hatred to their mm -hmm. son that they say things like you know it's going to be hard for me to love my son when he's a man because 
men are responsible for oppressing women. Those kind of messages from either a male, a, a father or a mother are, are gonna cause damage to a child. They are, if it's not gender ideology damage, it's gonna come out some other way mm -hmm. because kids do need to be loved and accepted. And I want to reinforce what you said about encouraging children to do a variety of activities. And I love the way you modeled those two tones. And it can even be in a relationship building way. If a father says, hey, son, I really love spending time with you and I want to do what you enjoy doing. So how about we do, you know, whatever the son likes to do. How about, you know, I'll take a guitar class with you. Will you also come um, hunting with me one weekend? I'd like to share my hobby with you and I'd like to learn about your hobby. And that's a fabulous way to build relationship. Yeah. And also just to expand a child's experience, which is what childhood is about. Yeah. Yep. So do you have another question? We've got one more question. Um, I'm wondering about parents' thoughts on where asexuality fits into all of this conversation, mm -hmm. especially from a genetic perspective. My husband and I often talk about our own preferences and sexuality, and I have very little drive, save for very early on in my cycle each month. I'm curious how others have seen their own sexual preferences and predisposition, such as tomboyish women, effeminate males, hypersexualized, asexual preferences play out in their kids, if at all. And I wanna say, I got permission from both of these parents to use these questions. <laughs> this well, and that, that question um, in some ways just drives me crazy because parents these days are so concerned about their children's sexuality. and. It's not uncommon for boys to um, not express a sexual interest until their mid twenties. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 I always joke, my husband and I had such different experiences sexually. I was very sexual at a very young age um, and that wasn't healthy. It was actually quite dangerous. He said he was completely oblivious until he was 19 or 20, um, mm -hmm. just completely like clueless. Um, he said that there was one girl when he was in element, uh, maybe it was junior high, who used to flash herself at the boys to get a reaction. And he always just was like, what? Like, he was just so confused by it. So, so it's, there are kids who aren't going to have any sexual proclivities until they're older. And that's okay. I would be much more concerned about a child who comes out and says that they're, um, you know, declares their sexuality when they're eight, nine, 10, 11 years old than a child who says they're asexual because asexual is actually more than the norm for children. Um, children really aren't supposed to be sexualized until they're old enough to really understand the implications of getting involved in a sexual relationship. Well, and puberty is the time that kids start waking up sexually. This is the thing that I'm so horrified when I see teachers and counselors mm -hmm. and principals introducing sexual and gender topics to prepubescent kids, that is abuse. Yeah. That is sexual abuse because puberty is the time when your sex drive starts to awaken. That's, the, that's just biologically, physiologically when it happens. Mm -hmm. And kids shouldn't be introduced to topics about sex and gender before then. It's too much baggage. It's too heavy for them to carry. And you're right. Some kids, even going through puberty, aren't going to experience particular sexual drive. And I think about autism. Autistic kids, they're very like inward focused. They're kind of all about their own selves and their own interests. And they don't even start noticing that, oh, there are other people around. Oh, and some of them are not like me mm -hmm. until they're much older. <laughs> and that's normal. And we should, we should celebrate that. And we should, you know. And yeah. even with autism, um, some autistic kids have a lot of sensory issues. And, you know, the idea of touching and kissing other people is kind of repulsive to them. Um, so again, it takes puberty to kick that in. And even then sometimes it doesn't kick in. And that's okay. I remember thinking that I was just a freak because I always had um, more of a sex drive than, than my boyfriends or husbands. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I always thought I was just a horrible freak. And, and I can't even remember wh where I was, but I started talking about, you know, feeling like I was some kind of pervert. And, and another woman was like, 
I have the same thing. And I was like, really? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the only one. Um, and so oh, I'm different. we're all different and, we, and, it, and it changes, you know, throughout life. It changes with our experiences. And I also think that um, sex is often used as a, as a drug of sorts. And so I noticed the more that I've healed from, you know, the trauma I had as a child, the more my sex drive has gotten kind of more controlled. Um, and I do think it's because I was using sex to, um, you know, to meet needs that yeah. should have been met in other ways. And I worry that a lot of these kids now are, are doing that. They're going to pornography and, and, and they're becoming sexualized really young to meet needs that should be met in other ways, um, but they're not getting them met. So they're going, and, and again, as you mentioned, once a boy goes into porn, we have to be very concerned because of this is a sissy hypno porn that's out there that's actively trying mm -hmm. to feminize. Um, uh, gosh, bim bimbification, I think is one of the words they use yeah. to turn them into basically slutty girls. It's just completely um, creepy. So I would encourage um, parents of boys to monitor their, their internet use very carefully to keep them away from porn. And if you've got a son who is... Um, saying they identify as, as transgender, I would, I would investigate and see if they've been watching porn because my hunch is, you know, there's a good chance they have been. It's so ubiquitous. It's just so ubiquitous. And it's hard to stay away from. I've talked to so many parents now who've said, I mean, I can't even like close the door to my house and keep it outside because it's coming in through the phones. It's coming in through the laptops, you know, the school iPads that are supposedly locked down and kids, you know, kids are pretty savvy. They find ways around those. It's very, very difficult to keep this stuff out. Mm -hmm. You have to be active and intentional. Mm -hmm. um, you can't be neutral on this anymore because it's coming. It's coming for our kids. And, and hopefully that's something we can change. I always encourage people to, um, you know, to, to contact legislators in your areas there are ways that we can, we can regulate this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one would be verification of age, which, you know, we can do for other things. Um, we need to be doing that for this. We need to be really protecting kids because again, um, you know, porn has such a big influence on, on identity and how these kids are processing their sexuality and what it means to be male and female. So um, I would encourage people to, um, look at Alex Aaron's um, page and she's got some really good information about porn and how it's affecting our kids. Yeah. Well, do you feel like we touched on everything we wanted to today? Yeah, it's such a big topic, but I think the main thing I really want to um, emphasize before we leave is that there are very different categories um, mm -hmm. that kids fall into and it's really important to identify which category your son is falling into because that's gonna um, dramatically influence how you respond to them and um, sort of what the, what the seed of that trans identity is and help you to understand where they're coming from. Yeah, and also when you consider all of the different reasons why a boy or a girl might adopt this identity, there's some very different and polar opposite reasons why this would be happening. How could there possibly be one treatment plan for all of this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. How could there possibly be always affirmation, always affirmation, always affirmation? That makes no sense. Makes no earthly sense. No. And in fact, you know, anytime you take a healthy child's body and damage it, that that should be considered medical abuse. Um, there's yeah. just no excuse for it. Mm -hmm. And again, if a child, um, you know, grows up and and as an adult, they decide to do these things. That's really, you know, I mean, I'm not happy about it, but it's their choice. But the fact that um, we have organizations actively pushing this onto our kids really um, is, again, another example that this is a cult. This is not about health care. This is not about the best interests of the children. Yeah, this is, a, this is a cult. It's a political and financial scheme. Yeah. Well, what are we talking about next week? Next week, um, we have had some parents tell us that our role playing, when we role play conversations between parents and kids, that that's been really effective for them. Okay. I thought maybe next week we could just do a whole episode of role playing how different conversations might go 
around um, issues of transgender identity. That sounds great. And I look forward to seeing you next week, Maria. All right, see you then. <laughs> Bye-bye. We are not doctors or therapists. We are not giving medical or psychiatric advice, and we offer no guarantee of outcomes. We simply want to talk about how to support and love kids using long understood best practices from the fields of psychology, education, and child development. We're glad you joined in our conversation today, and we hope that you took away something you can put in your toolkit for parenting your gender-confused kids with truth and love.